Hi everybody, I'm Gail Z. Martin, and Inheritance is the latest in the Deadly Curiosities series. Deadly Curiosities uh, is set in Charleston, South Carolina, and it's all about getting cursed and haunted objects out of the wrong hands and saving the world from supernatural threats. And uh, the books can be read in any order, although uh, you might enjoy reading them uh, from the start but you can certainly pick up and jump in. Uh, they all work as standalones. And Inheritance, like I said, is the newest in the series. There'll be more out later this year. I have a problem antique I'd like you to take a look at. The man on the other end of the call sounded rattled. I recognized his name, Alfred Stone from Stone Auctions, but I didn't think we'd ever spoken, let alone met. What kind of problem does it present, I asked. A number of possibilities came to mind. Questionable provenance? Not sure how to authenticate? I think it's trying to kill me. Well, damn, that kind of problem. All right, Mr. Stone, try to stay calm. I just told you it's trying to kill me. I heard you know about these things. Please help me. Across the store, Teague Logan glanced up to make sure everything was all right. I nodded and he went back to helping a customer. I can come now. Are you at the showroom? Yes, thank you, and please, hurry. I ended the call and sighed. This might be the first time Alfred Stone had an antique try to kill him, but that made it just another day here at Trifles and Folly. I'm Cassidy Kincaid and I own Trifles and Folly, an antique and curio shop in historic haunted Charleston, South Carolina. The shop has been in my family for more than 300 years. While we're known as a great place to buy high quality antiques, the shop is also a cover for the Alliance, a coalition of moral, mortals and immortals who save Charleston and the world from supernatural threats. I'm a psychometric, which means I can read the history and magic of objects by touching them. Teague is my assistant store manager, best friend, and sometimes bodyguard, and he's also a talented weaver witch. Soren, my business partner, is a nearly 600-year-old vampire. Together with some other friends with very specialized abilities, we do our best to keep the world safe from dark magic and things that go bump in the night. Problem? Teague asked when the customer left. I'm not sure, I replied. Alfred Stone just called from the auction house. He says he's got an item that's trying to kill him. You want me to go with you? Teague pushed a lock of dark hair out of his eyes. His skater boy haircut and skinny jeans made him look younger than his late 20s. Maggie can handle the store. On cue, Maggie, our lifesaver of a part-time associate, waved to agree from the other side of the store. She was sporting a bright new pink streak in her short gray hair, and it matched her sweater, a reminder, as if I ever needed one, that she believed in taking risks and living large. I reached up to slick my humidity-frizzed strawberry blonde hair back into a ponytail and shook my head. Let me go see what the problem is and I'll figure out what to do from there. It's not far away in case I need to give a shout. Just let me know, he said with a look that told me I'd better not get myself hurt. I can be there in 10 minutes. When in doubt, call. I promise. I appreciated Teague's concern, but I had proven my ability to hold my own against some pretty nasty creatures. And while I didn't intend to push my luck, I didn't know enough about Stone's problem to call in the cavalry just yet. As I drove over to Stone Auctions, I tried to remember what I knew about the man and his business. While Trifles and Folly had enough of a reputation in the area that a lot of people sold their items directly to us, Teague and I sometimes bought from auctions and estate sales. Occasionally, an item would be listed that we knew would be a perfect fit for our typical customers, who were tourists looking for a one-of-a-kind souvenir, interior designers searching for just the right piece, or antique enthusiasts hunting down the perfect addition to their collection. More often, we bought pieces because they were cursed, haunted, or so tainted with bad mojo from long-ago tragedies that we needed to make sure nobody got hurt. Usually, we spotted a dangerous piece ourselves or got a heads up from someone in our network of friends. This time, whatever had spooked Alfred Stone had enough juice to get his attention, even though he didn't have insider knowledge about how, just how much of a spookapalooza Charleston really was. That told me the item might be especially dangerous. To my surprise, Stone was waiting for me near the front desk. He looked like he'd probably hovered behind the poor receptionist since he called me. Cassidy Kincaid, he asked, extending his hand. I'm Alfred Stone. Stone was a stocky man who looked to be in his 50s, and he stood only a few inches taller than my 5'8 height. He had a twitchy energy that I suspected was a combination of caffeine and hustle. The man also had a black eye and a gauze bandage on his forehead like he'd been in a fight. His once-over glance told me that I looked younger than he expected. I'm close to Teague's age, but I don't look it. Someday that may be an advantage. Now it's more of a liability. I gave Stone credit for not mentioning it. Good to meet you, Mr. Stone. I've attended some of your events, but we've never had the opportunity to meet. Alfred, please. I smiled, trying to set him at ease. Cassidy, now that we're on a first name basis, I hope we could get down to business. How can I help? Alfred led me down a hallway away from the reception area. 
If you've been to some of our events, then you know Stone Auctions has an eye for the unusual, the offbeat. Our repeat buyers know they can come to us for pieces that are, if not completely unique, then at least unlikely to pop up everywhere. He tugged at his collar, trying to hide his discomfort. Sometimes we end up with pieces that are unsettling. We've had items made from bone and odd taxidermy pieces, mourning jewelry, that sort of thing, but I've never sensed anything dangerous, until now. I didn't have the heart to tell him. That was because Teague and I bought the malicious items from prior sales before they had a chance to hurt anyone. Since he hadn't recognized their negative juju, then whatever it was that freaked him out had to be hella bad. Which, given the kinds of things I'd seen since I took over the store, could go anywhere from soul-sucking demons to end-of-the-world Viking sorcerers. Never a dull moment. How did you come to purchase it, I asked. Not that I expected Alfred to give up his sources, those were a trade secret in this business, but I needed something to go on, and finding out where a piece came from usually told me a lot about what to expect. Through a seller's representative, Alfred replied. Fairly common from someone who wants to sell a piece but doesn't wish to handle the sale directly. I'm sure you've done acquisitions that way yourself. I had, but rarely. Given our particular specialty at Trifles and Folly, I like to know exactly who I was dealing with. Sometimes that could be a life or death detail. Anyhow, this gentleman assured me that the piece had been in the collection of a very wealthy man from an old family whose will directed that the pieces be sold after his death, Alfred said. Did he give you a name of the man or the family? I had a bad feeling about this. There was a thin line between discretion and deception. No, although all the paperwork seemed to be in order, Alfred replied, shaking his head. And before you asked, I tried to reach him when the problems began, but his number had been disconnected. His cheeks colored, telling me he knew exactly how bad that sounded. Great. So it's not just a secret. The piece was probably stolen. There could be situations in which a representative could not disclose the former owner. That was rare because an item's history, the fancy word is provenance, usually increases the price. A common object that was owned by a famous person is worth far more than the item itself would fetch. Keeping the ownership and history a secret hurt the representative's ability to get the best price for the client unless the history would cause a scandal. Or, as I suspect it happened here, the item was hot. I know what you're thinking, Alfred said with an embarrassed expression. I may have left myself open to legalities, a rookie mistake, and I assure you I am no rookie. But the piece wasn't terribly expensive, although it was unique, and it called to me. I realize how that sounds. It sounded exactly like what would happen if a cursed object saw the perfect victim. What you're describing isn't that unusual when an object has troublesome energy. I'd learned to use phrasing that didn't come right out and mention ghosts and magic to set people at ease. People who wanted to get back to their ordinary lives and forget that they ever got a glimpse of the supernatural. Sometimes the lucky ones could do just that. Usually it wasn't that simple. We reached the door to the storage area where items are checked in, cataloged, and tagged while awaiting their turn in the spotlight during an auction. When the auction theater, while the auction theater is luxurious, like good seats at the symphony or opera, the room Alfred led me to was utilitarian with functional wooden racks and plenty of shipping boxes. He crossed to a far corner to a small room with a steel door and a reinforced glass window. It's in here. Alfred sounded less than excited about getting close to the troublesome piece. He unlocked the door and gestured for me to go inside. While I was ready for danger, I had to admit to being curious, especially since Alfred seemed to swing between fear and chagrin. That's it. All right then. Now I understood, at least a little bit more. It wasn't every day when a well-to-do business owner was forced to admit he was terrified by a framed mosaic made up entirely of seashells. It's a sailor's valentine, I said, recognizing the style. I leaned closer, careful not to touch. While the idea of an intricate design crafted from shells sounds like a kitschy souvenir, antique sailor's valentines could be true works of folk art and fetch thousands of dollars. This one was particularly well done with a floral rose inside a nautical wind rose enclosed in a detailed decorative border and all of it painstakingly pieced together from naturally colored seashells. We can authenticate the original ownership, Alfred asserted, probably hoping to regain my professional respect. It's old, the date on the back says 1845, and the appraiser confirmed that the materials are consistent with that period. The writing next to the date reads, to my darling Millicent, undying love from Joseph. Do you have any idea who Joseph and Millicent were? Unfortunately, no, Alfred admitted. The representative said that it had been given by a sailor to his fiancée when he returned to port. He cleared his throat. Unfortunately, it was a parting gift because the sailor had already married someone else. After that, the piece passed through various hands until it was acquired a few decades later by the family of the late owner. 
I walked around the piece, which was secured on an easel. The mahogany frame appeared to be in good shape, and despite the age of the piece, the shells had not discolored or come loose from their glue, and the glass had no chips or breaks. The shell work itself was a wonder, using a variety of types, common cockles, beaded periwinkles, baby's ears, bubbles, jingles, and more, in an array of colors and sizes. I can understand why it would catch somebody's eye, assuming they couldn't feel the psychic reek of malevolent energy that made me recoil. If it has that much resonance when I'm a foot away, I really don't want to know how it feels to pick up. When an item gave off vibes that were that strong, I could usually get a read without having to touch it. I closed my eyes, aware that Alfred was watching, and reached out with my psychometry, stretching my gift toward the piece, but not getting any closer than necessary. Hatred and vengeance felt, hit me like a punch to the face. After all this time, the resonance was so powerful that I caught my breath and took a defensive step back. I saw everything, like a movie in Fast Forward. Millicent's happiness that her beloved had returned from the sea and her delight in the beautiful gift, Joseph's ad admission of betrayal, her shock turning to grief and then cooling into anger, a heated argument and the swing of a candlestick in rage, leaving Joseph in a pool of blood, fear, remorse, loss, and guilt, and then a knife blade that Millicent used to open veins and let herself die beside her faithless lover. The vision ended as abruptly as it had begun, leaving me breathless. I might have spared some sympathy for Millicent despite her reaction if I didn't feel the temperature drop and know from the prickle on my skin that Millicent's spirit still clung to the tragic gift. Get back! I reached into the pocket of my jacket and grabbed a handful of the loose salt I kept there for situations just like this. As Millicent's spirit began to take shape and the air around us grew freezing cold, I hurled a handful of salt at her ghostly outline, making her flicker and vanish. Run! I grabbed Alfred by the arm and dragged him with me as I sprinted toward the storage room door. I disrupted Millicent's manifestation, but it wouldn't take a spirit that strong long to regroup. I slammed the door and reached into my larger tote. In this business, it never paid to leave home without tools of the trade. I grabbed a canister of salt and a small bag of iron filings. Go over there, I ordered, and Alfred was all too happy to put distance between himself and the small room. Then I laid down a line of salt across the threshold and sprinkled iron filings on top. As an extra precaution, I hung a small blessed silver chain from the door handle. What are you doing? Alfred sounded skeptical, but curious. I straightened and put the items back in my bag, just to be safe. I palmed an iron dagger and an old wooden spoon I used as a wand and to channel my touch magic defensively. Keeping Millicent in the storage room until we can send her on her way, I replied. His eyes widened. So you saw her too? Yep. Throwing salt at her brought us, bought us time to get out, but it won't stop her from manifesting again. And the line at the door will only hold her for a while. I think we need to talk while I call in a consult. Alfred seemed lost in thought as he led me to his office. I paused in the hallway to call Father Ann Burgett. Cassidy, what's up? Father Ann knew I didn't call to chat. Got a vengeful ghost I could use some help with. Are you free? She chuckled. Give me the address and I'll be there as soon as I can. I rattled off the information and walked to the front desk to let the receptionist know I was expecting someone. When I came back to Alfred's office, he was pacing and looked like he could use a stiff drink. I called in a priest to help the spirit move on, I hope, I told him, and I'd like you to send everyone home so no one gets hurt from Millicent acting up. But before my priest friend gets here, I need to know everything, including how you got that black eye. So that is the beginning of Inheritance, which is the most recent book in the Deadly Curiosities series. Uh, it's in uh, paperback, ebook, and uh, hopefully coming soon to audiobook. And uh, there will be more in the series coming soon. Talk to you later.